you wherever you are, whether you're seated there at home or in an office or or you're driving down the road in some kind of vehicle. I trust that uh, the Lord is be making himself very real to you. It's early morning here in Euless, Texas, and uh, I am here at the breakfast table. Marthy has gone to take uh, our youngest son, John, to uh, school. About once a week, she takes a load of boys, all of them 13 years old, uh, to school. And so while she's on her way to school, I'm here making at least the introduction to this tape. Uh, this is a beautiful scene during our uh, kitchen area, I guess you'd call it. It's a breakfast nook. You look out in the backyard and you see about 10 or 12 trees. And about 85, 90% of the time in the fall like this, there's there will be a few squirrels out there playing. And this week has been no exception. It's a beautiful time in this part of the country. The clouds have uh, passed away and the sun is shining bright bright, bright, and uh, it's just a wonderful time. It's not too cold, and it's not too hot, and it's just a marvelous time. And right now, our hearts are all excited about a number of things. Uh, possibly most of you are aware that uh, uh, Martha and I have uh, four children. The oldest is Debbie, uh, our daughter. She's not married. She's 24. She is uh, staying here in town. And uh, her uh, involvement in the Lord is in the local church and also uh, in the local bookstore where she works. Then our son, Manley Jr., who is married to uh, Charlene, and they are the ones that have... Uh, our grandson, Manly Christopher, who is now seven months old and is adding a great deal of joy to his grandmother and granddad. And then we have a son, Stephen, who is 20 years old, who um, is in school locally, preparing to be a minister. And the Lord is doing some wonderful things for him. He is. He has plans to be married in uh, January to a young lady from Anchorage, Alaska, Monica Schaff. And now Stephen and Manley Jr. both are preparing for the ministry. And it's such a joy to have them around. And with them around means a bunch more boys around always. Uh, wanting some word of wisdom. And then uh, we have John, the boy 13, that Marthy has now gone to take school. Well, anyway, so much for that. I'd just like to keep you uh, aware of the family because I, I tell you, I sense the need of the prayers of the saints so much. I believe that our real problem today is that we're not as a mighty army of God uh, really praying for the saints, for each other. And there's only one way that we could go as a mighty army of God, praying for each other, and that is that we would be regimented by some man or some leader. And that is possible, of course, but uh, so costly. Or that we be, uh, that we be um, arrested and and that we be brought in by the Holy Spirit. And on that level, most of us are not sensitive enough to have a part in a real great prime ministry. Well, with this tape each month, I trust that as you listen, you're encouraged to pray and pray for my family. Uh, preachers that are standing true to the gospel today 
are under the gun for many reasons, because people are looking for men who are real, who are genuine, who are just genuinely on the ball. And uh, then the other reason, the devil's looking for a crowd and watching to see if the men who claim to be real just are going to fail. So the devil really is out after God's children. And so I trust that you'll pray. Pray for me the day you hear this tape. Pray that God's wisdom will be mine, that I might literally relate to him properly and to my fellow man properly. And I believe if you love the Lord with all of your heart, all of your being, and your neighbor is yourself, you fulfill the commandments. And I really feel that uh, you need to pray for me on this level. Well, there's so much going on right now. Uh, many of you have listened to me share from time to time about the uh, building that's going to be built here in this area that will take care of evangelists and related ministries. And it seems that we're making progress, but the battle has been tough. Uh, we've run into misunderstanding about the land, and men that have promised us that they would do things haven't done things. And I trust it's they're failing to uh, come through. Haven't um, been on the basis of um, our getting our eyes on man rather than God. Uh, but the brother that's been used of God to provide the money to build the building uh, is on his way from Alaska. And he's coming to stay, he and his wife, to until the building is built. The other men involved in it directly uh, are all on ready. They are just ready to go and start the building. The only people that are not uh, on ready uh, is the individual that we left in charge of the land. And so uh, there seems to be some type of selfishness involved uh, that obviously uh, uh, will show itself up as the devil sooner or later. Well, anyway... Uh, you pray about that project because this project will bless thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. A lot of people on my heart today, as I talk to you, I'm thinking about a boy that is the head of uh, Graphic Truth. Uh, he is a young man that's in great need. He He's in a very responsible place. And uh, he uh, needs your prayers. And so I trust that you'll pray for him. His name is Steve Schiffman. I, I may have mentioned him to you on this uh, tape club before, but I may not have. But Steve is the head of Graphic Truth. Graphic Truth puts the gospel on television in 30 seconds, and uh, it's right on prime time. And I'll tell you, it's beautiful how God is using this instrument. He will preach to billions of people this year, not millions, but billions. So you pray for him today. Now, <clears throat> pray for the book ministry. By the time you receive this tape, Faith Workbook number two will be uh, off to the printers for bids about who will print it. And my heart's desire is that this book uh, get out on God's schedule. I have uh, been a long time in writing it. We are spending a great deal of time in, in going over it and over it. And uh, I trust that we're not trying to make it so perfect that it'll be a work of, uh, of you know, art rather than a, uh, or a work of uh, the mind is what I really want to say rather than the work of the Spirit, because a lot of times the Holy Spirit comes across rather strong and uh, direct, and we didn't get to working on it, you know, to where we, we try to make it uh, <laughs> a masterpiece, and while we do it, we take the life of God out of it. Well, anyway, uh, by the time you hear this tape, this... 
book will be off to the printers. And I'm expecting God to bless it. First of all, because I believe he uh, gave the material to write. And then uh, the second reason is that I am trusting him to supernaturally work in the uh, distribution of it. And thirdly, I want to be sensitive to do just exactly what he wants to do. Well, invariably, when uh, I start making this tape, the devil really starts working and creates a real hassle if he can. And as I have uh, been making this tape for you, the devil has been doing just that to keep me from getting this tape uh, complete for you. Well, the Lord is continuing to bless in some other ways. Just don't forget the book, but nevertheless, uh, recently we leased a building that's going to house a number of men, and uh, in this particular building we're going to be able to build a, a small uh, recording room, and this is going to be super for us because uh, this has cut out a lot of the uh, era that we're running into, and I think that we'll be able to be a little more professional in the recording of these tapes. Although uh, I enjoy the relaxed position of recording the tape like I'm recording this morning, even though while I'm taping the chimes are going off and the telephone ringing in the background, yet it's a beautiful sight to uh, be able to look out and see the beautiful sun and the trees and the creation of God and see the squirrels playing and so on. But nevertheless, it, uh, this building is going to be a great asset. It's going to be a, bring a number of us together that will eventually be in the building that uh, is going to be built. And so I praise the Lord for that. Now, <clears throat> you may be uh, interested in knowing this. I, I feel like that I've never really just shared with people all that God has put on my heart. And I do want to share a little here of something that the Lord has placed on my heart. And uh, that is this. I feel that the Lord showed me back some years ago that the way to minister to the world and meet the needs of the church was to set up key places across the world where we would come and have conferences where the saints of God could be taught and the lost could be reached. And um, I feel like that the Lord is putting this together now. I am not sure about the details, but I do know that uh, the Lord is raising up places that have a vision and uh, have a real anticipation of reaching the world for the Lord and uh, really ministering to the church in its last days that the church might be brought to the place that uh, they have a real understanding of what it means to know the Lord and have the Lord expressed in his character in their life and have the Lord uh, empowering its life to where they can, uh, where the church can be a reproductive uh, body. And I, I feel that the Lord... Uh, is going to also use radio to accomplish this end. Now, I haven't mentioned this before, but for years now, I've been praying that the Lord would move in, <clears throat> excuse me, the matter of radio. And I feel like that he really initiated this area in my heart. I've been waiting for the right time. I uh, have had different individuals to consult with me about this matter. A few weeks ago, a young man, a very capable young man, uh, came and made himself available on this level. And he's spending a great deal of time now researching the situation. And we're going to tie the conferences and the radio meetings in together. And uh, 
I believe we're going to see the Lord mightily use this. I believe the church is in deep need this hour for some spiritual debt. Uh, I feel that uh, as Baptists, for many, many years, they worked on a work-level principle. Say, get saved. You're saved by grace through faith. Boy, that, I mean, strictly, that was real. But after you get saved, then try your best. And then about 20 years ago, the uh, spirit-filled life teaching began to get into the church. And I believe some people took it and went way off out there into uh, excesses. And then I believe some people reacted to the spirit-filled life and uh, just said, man, it, uh, uh, that's of the devil. But I believe others discovered Jesus is all they needed not only in salvation, but for sanctification and for service. And I believe they've settled in on Jesus in a right level, and I believe there's been a new dimension of living in the life of individuals as well in the, as in the life of churches. I have been saved for, 20, oh, for 30 years and saved 29 years, and I believe I see God doing more on a grace level in churches today than I've ever seen in my life. Now, I may be wrong, but I just feel this. Now, by no means are we seeing a revival across the world, but I believe God is definitely blessing and moving in power and in glory, and I am just looking forward to what he's going to do on down the road. Now, <clears throat> these conferences, I believe, are in the making. I believe God's going to raise up churches uh, and God's going to really use the local church to be the uh, uh, catalyst or be the place of service and so on, just as the instrument by which God will accomplish this goal. Uh, I would hate to see us leave out the local church. I believe that's God's chosen plan. Now, uh, last month I mentioned to you about the books. And we had about 20 people to respond and want to get involved in the uh, book and tape missionary ministry. Now, you might say, well, this is just another gimmick. Well, let me just share with you what uh, one of the little ideas about it. And I may have shared this last month to this degree, and I may not have. But uh, we have about 20 or 30 people that buy books and tapes by the... Uh, fifties and hundred lots at a time. And these people pay about uh, about 20% over cost for these books, maybe 30% uh, over cost. Now, if we can uh, get them involved in this, these books are going to be sent out at cost. And they can give away more pe books to more people that they find that's in need. And I've found through the years that God has mightily used books and tapes to minister to my heart when I had a need. I could not always get to a man with an anointed message, so I needed a book or a tape, and I got it. And I praise God for that. So if you're still interested in the tape and book ministry, you let us know, and I will send you an individual tape um, indicating to you the plan. And uh, all I ask you to do is just send a couple of dollars along uh, to help us make the tape and uh, send it back to you because we just do not have the equipment where we make our own tapes and come up with a cost of 30 or 40 cents on a tape. It's not that easy for us. And so I trust that you'll get involved in this. Well, on this month's tape, I'm working at uh, putting you two... Uh, short uh, messages on the tape. And so I trust that you will uh, uh, pray for us as I speak to you that the Word of God might speak directly to you even though uh, I am not aware who's listening to this tape at this moment, but that God will take the Word, speak it directly to your heart. Well, in this first study on this particular tape, I want to uh, deal with the Holy Spirit. 
uh, when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I do not believe in uh, God the Father, number one, is the most important. God the Son, number two, is the second most important. And God the Holy Spirit is the third most important. When we talk about the three, we're talking about uh, the three having uh, co-equal positions. And we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Many times we have referred to the Holy Spirit as the third person in the Trinity. And some folk feel that, uh, you know, uh, he is the third down the ladder in significance. But that is not the case. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about an it. There's a lot of people refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. And then, of course, we're not talking about him as an it. And then neither are we talking about the Holy Spirit as a um, influence. But we're actually talking about the Holy Spirit as a um, personality. And I like the fact that he is a personality. I'm so glad that the Father has uh, given us a person to uh, relate to. Now, as I talk to you, I, I'm recalling uh, some statements from a great man of God, Dr. James A. Stewart uh, from Scotland. He used to say the Holy Spirit is God's throne gift, God's throne gift to the church. And uh, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, that was God delivering his gift to the church, the Holy Spirit. And my, he would talk to you about the Holy Spirit in such a way that uh, it would uh, literally just make you conscious that the Holy Spirit was there in person. And actually the Holy Spirit is here in person. Well, the messages that I want to bring you on the Holy Spirit will vary, but today I want to talk to you about the personality of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is a very important doctrine that you and I realize that the Holy Spirit is a personality. Now, I'm not going to uh, resort to any other form of, of um, other form than just, just presenting you the Bible as the basis for showing us that the Holy Spirit is a person. In other words, I'm, we're not going to try to establish this historically. Uh, we're not going to try to, to establish it, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, Greek text necessarily. We're not going to try to uh, resort to logic to try to prove to you that the Holy Spirit is a person, but just give you the Word of God. And as we give you the Word of God, I believe that the Holy Spirit will take the Word and make the Word real to you. But the Bible uses personal pronouns in referring to the Holy Spirit throughout the Word. And so uh, I want to give you these verses, different verses that relate to the Holy Spirit in identifying Him in the form of a personal pronoun. And, of course, my favorite is John 15. But the, and the Bible says, But when the Comforter is come, he shall testify of me. And then in John 16, 8, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. And uh, then in John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you. John 16, 14, He shall glorify me for he shall receive a mine. And it's so beautiful that the Lord uh, here lets us see in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit uh, is definitely identified as a person in this beautiful language. And not only do we find that the Bible makes it clear by the use of these personal pronouns in reference to the Holy Spirit. But the Bible makes it clear 
that the Holy Spirit possesses certain characteristics that identify him as a person. Like, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, But all these worketh, that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing every man severally as he wills. In other words, the Holy Spirit has a will, and he makes decisions. Not only that, but there is in, there is the fact that he has an intelligence. Nehemiah 9.20, Thou givest also thy good spirit to instruct them. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? And then in Romans 8.27, And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession. That's beautiful, isn't it? The Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Spirit, and he makes intercession. Oh, that's, that's so wonderful. When we do not know how and what to pray for, the Holy Spirit is there uh, to work in our lives and through our lives uh, to make intercession for us. Well, it's so wonderful that the Word of God is so clear. And not only does the Holy Spirit have will, a will, he has intelligence, but he also has knowledge. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has knowledge and knows all things. And so, we go a little further, we find that the Holy Spirit has power. In Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The Holy Spirit powerfully charged the men at Pentecost throughout the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit empowered them. So the Holy Spirit has power. The Holy Spirit moves in power and in glory. And not only does the Holy Spirit have power, but he has a capacity for love. Romans 15.30, for the love of the Spirit. And not only does he have the capacity for love, but he has a capacity for grief. In Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is a person because he thinks, he feels, he purposes, he knows, he wills. He loves and he's grieved. The characteristics indicate that the Holy Spirit has the ability of a person. The Holy Spirit also does things that only a person can do. For instance, look in 1 Corinthians 2.10. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. That's right. He can go beyond all these things. I, as one man put it, he can even go beyond the uh, computers and so on. Well, nevertheless, the Holy Spirit searched the deep things of God. Not only does the Holy Spirit search the deep things of God, the Holy Spirit can speak. Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Holy Spirit can cry out. Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons... God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit intercedes, Romans 8, 26. The Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit testified, John 15, 6. But when the Comforter is come, He shall testify me. The Holy Spirit teaches, John 14, 6. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he shall teach you all things, bringing all things to your remembrance. This ability is also mentioned in John 16, 12 through 4, Nehemiah 9 through 20, and 9 and 20. The Holy Spirit leads and directs, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do I personally know of that's the leading? Do you? Do you think you know the Lord definitely leading you? The Holy Spirit commands. Acts 16, 6 and 7. And uh, there were 
forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, the Holy Spirit calls men to work and give them tasks. For instance, in Acts 13.2, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Also in Acts 20.28, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The Holy Spirit proceeds on the mission to which he is sent. John 15, 26, Whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So we see here uh, that the Holy Spirit is doing things that only a person could do. Let's mention the fact that the Holy Spirit has been signed, assigned a definite job or an office in relationship to us. He is our official comforter, uh, John 14, 16. He can be grieved, Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. He can be insulted, Hebrews 10, 29. He can be lied to, Acts 5, 3. Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He can be blasphemed, Matthew 12, 31 and 32, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and so on. The Holy Spirit definitely ha has been identified, I believe, in the sense of a person of, in the Word of God. I believe not only has he be been identified in the Bible as a person, but I believe he has been given the responsibility of a person. And I, I trust today that you will seek the Lord and ask him to give you light concerning the person of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Father has a dwelling place. The Son has a dwelling place. And the Holy Spirit has a dwelling place. Have you ever considered where the Holy Spirit's dwelling place is? The Holy Spirit's dwelling place is... I would like to talk with you on the second message concerning uh, spiritual growth. You know, I, I feel like that uh, one of the big issues in the church today is uh, spiritual growth. In fact, uh, it seems that we've learned how to grow, uh, build big churches, but not grow great Christians. And I feel as Baptists that we have really failed to uh, understand how to grow people spiritually. And I'm not real sure that uh, we have got the answers yet with all the different programs that are coming out. Uh, in fact, a man can spend his time full time just going from one program to another program on uh, trying to teach people how to grow. And I, I'll tell you, it's a real issue. I know in my own heart I have uh, made a very careful study of what has helped my own children to grow. And I've watched them grow spiritually. I've watched them just, to, just I mean, go and grow just uh, uh, real, real fast. And then I watched them slow down and, and grow slow. And then I watched them speed up again. And I have really searched to see uh, what's made each one of the children grow spiritually. And then I have watched Christians across the uh, world grow spiritually. And, and I've been very interested in that. And just for instance, a couple of weeks ago, there was three boys here in the home. Uh, one was our son, one was a nephew, and then a visiting young man. And we were discussing spiritual growth. And I had just given the different uh, basic concepts of spiritual growth. And uh, as I gave these basic concepts of spiritual growth, I uh, felt that they were very valid. And then the very outstanding man came in and one of the young men asked him what he thought was a real contributing factor to spiritual growth. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, human effort. And it was just, it was, 
just so uh, unusual and yet very damaging. Because I believe in the uh, book of First John, we have an outline that relates to spiritual growth. And I would like to take you to uh, the book of First John and point out a few verses of Scripture to you that I feel will give us a little bit of help concerning this matter of spiritual growth. Now, in the second chapter of the book of First John, the 14th verse, we have a division here. We see little children mentioned, and we see uh, fathers mentioned, and we see uh, young men mentioned. And actually, it really takes in uh, uh, verses uh, 2, thir 12, 13, and 14. And, uh, of course, the word, the teaching about little children is found throughout, the teaching about fathers found throughout, and the uh, teaching concerning uh, young men is found throughout. Now, I believe this relates to a spiritual growth pattern, not in the order that I just said, but in this order. First, there's little children. Second, there are sons, or young men. And then there are fathers. Now, I believe this relates to spiritual growth. Uh, I know that it really helped me. The other day I was talking to Norman Grubb, and as we talked, you know, he began to relate to uh, this matter of these three different areas, little children, uh, young men, and fathers. So I came back and began to pray about what to say to you this month. And I thought that the Lord would have me to just share with you uh, the truth about the little children and the young men and the fathers. And, of course, most of this is found right in the book of First John. Now, we will depart a little from the book of First John to bring in other verses of Scripture, uh, the thoughts that verses of Scripture uh, teach us. So um, let's just take a look at this matter of little children. First, obviously, that's the state uh, and condition of a person that has just simply been born of the Spirit of God. And as I have read through the book of First John and looked over the verses that relate to little children in the light of the complete message of uh, the book of First John, I find that uh, John is dealing with a matter of reality in the whole book. In fact, he, um, he deals with the uh, matter of reality on a subjective level. In other words, uh, it seems that he might even be willing to sacrifice an objective truth in order to, for a person to enter into a subjective experience. Now, we know that you do not have to. Um, sacrifice objective truth to have a legitimate subjective experience. But on the other hand, I, I believe that John is indicating the matter of entering into spiritual reality and the necessity at all costs, not at the cost of truth, of course, because truth is the basis of spiritual reality, but at all costs man must enter into spiritual reality. And the first step into that spiritual reality is the step of coming to know Jesus as your Savior, and this leaves you as a little child. And as he deals with little children throughout the book, it seems that he's, on a secondary basis, I think you'd say, uh, that he's really saying, now listen, you can know that you know the Lord. Now, you can just really know that you know Jesus Christ as uh, your Lord and Savior. You can just really know that you have been born of the Spirit of the living God. You can just really know that you have been washed, and uh, you can know this by the fact that your life experience, uh, expresses the uh, righteousness of Christ, for instance, such as you do not hate your brother, you love your brother, and so on. And so here we see that 
the matter of the little child or little children is a matter of coming to know Jesus in such a way that he is expressed in your life. I'm reminded of a verse in the book of John where the Bible teaches very clearly uh, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they were saying, the Pharisees were saying, we are of our father Abraham. And Jesus said, yes, I know. If you were of your father Abraham, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. And it seems that uh, John is dealing with the Christians, the little children on this level, and thereby establishing them in the fact of, uh, of really being little children. In other words, if you are a little child, uh, there will be the reality of Christ in you. And this Christ in you reality will be expressed in righteousness. In other words, you will not hate your brother, you will love your brother. And so on. So we see that entering into reality is of utmost importance in this matter of Christian life. And I believe that this is the first step that we need to literally teach uh, the little children in the world that are meaning that are saved by the grace of God and of their position in Christ about the cleansing blood and about the conscious walk with him that is expressed in righteousness. And I believe uh, this is a heart of the entire message of the book of John and I believe it's also uh, at the very basis of spiritual growth. Now, so when we come to teaching this matter of spiritual growth, we must discover if we're dealing with little children or if we're dealing with young men. Now, when we come to the matter of young men, we have in these verses, not only the Lord making reference, and when I say verses, we're talking about First John, the second chapter, the 12th, the 13th, and 14th verses, this especially, and then there are several other verses that relate to uh, the uh, little children, young men, and fathers. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about young men? It seems that the young men had moved on from that of their position in Christ to actually they had become overcomers. Actually, they had uh, learned how to overcome the issues that they faced in life. Now, let's just look for a moment at the issues that a young child of God faces. He faces the, the matter of guilt. He faces the matter of the sense of separation. In other words, uh, you know, he's not sensitive to the consciousness of God. He faces the matter of inadequacy. He faces the matter of fear and so on. Now, a person that uh, I believe move into the realm of a young man has learned and actually has become an overcomer over this matter of guilt, the matter of separation, the matter of inadequacy, and the matter of fear. But I believe he's gone beyond that. I believe he has uh, learned how to be an overcomer over sin. I believe he, le he has also learned how to handle the law. He's become an overcomer uh, of the law. And this is certainly a very serious matter. He's learned how to become an overcomer over self. And he's learned not only how to become an overcomer over self, but he's learned how to be an overcomer over the world. And I believe he's also learned how to be an overcomer over Satan. Now, it's very likely that we could spend a great deal of time at this very point. It's, uh, it's obvious that uh, most Christians we all know would um, fall in the category of being a slave to these uh, different areas. And so I, I trust that um, you will... Uh, uh, realize that uh, this matter of becoming a young man is becoming an overcomer. And we certainly have a great deal to overcome. We have a great deal to overcome subjectively and objectively. 
in this old world. And so I trust that uh, we realize that until we've learned to become an overcomer in these different areas that we just mentioned, that we certainly cannot be classified as uh, genuinely mature saints of God. And then uh, I believe that uh, after we have learned to become overcomers, I believe then that we're, we can move into the realm of uh, the fathers. And what is he talking about when he talks about fathers? I believe he is actually saying here that uh, you've learned how to enter into the realm of reality and salvation. And now you've learned also how to overcome uh, sin, the law, self, world, Satan, guilt, separation, inadequacy, fear, and so on. Now, now that you've learned to overcome these, now I believe your life is to be poured out upon the entire world. I believe you are to let the world have your life. I believe you are to discover your redemptive pers person. As one man puts it, I believe you enter into the saviorhood of the believer. It does not mean that you are a savior, but it means that through your life, the Lord reaches the part of the world that he intends to reach just through your life. You have entered into the realm of um, eternal activities, that all that you are doing is of eternal value, that uh, you've entered into the eternal purpose of God, that you've actually entered into the realm of such victory that you just literally pour your life out upon the world. Now, I believe this is expressed most beautifully in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, not only most beautifully is it expressed in the life of Jesus Christ, but I believe it's also expressed uh, most scripturally in his life where Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, identified himself uh, with the very purpose of God for his life and literally poured out his life and gave his life up as a sacrifice for the sins of man. He, he was the God of atonement of grace and redemption and he certainly became all of that uh, by obedience to the Father and offered salvation to the world from creation throughout eternity. He offered that salvation to the world. And so um, as a result of that, he, I believe, gives us an illustration of uh, the saviorhood of a believer. And he was certainly here in the most mature sense, a father. And uh, then another great illustration of that is in Romans, the ninth chapter, where Paul said, very clearly that he lied not, that he literally had it straight, his life was on the altar, and that he was willing to become a curse for his kinsmen. Now, to me, that's humanity so completely controlled by the Spirit of the living God. No human being, no human being within the realm of the natural could be willing to literally lay down his life and exchange his heavenly home uh, for a fiery grave and to go to hell forever unless there was so much of the love of God in him. And this certainly gives us somewhat of the dimension uh, of, what, of how deep God can reach into the heart of a man. It also gives us uh, how broad is the love of God, how wonderful the love of God is. And here Paul is, I believe, expressing the ultimate in the Christian life, and that is that he's become a father, the saviorhood of the believer. And uh, I believe that uh, there's such a need in the world for people to get to this state of maturity that their one objective in life is, is to please him and to go all the way with him. And whatever it takes, they are yielded to him and they'll never be satisfied they will never be satisfied until they have been brought into the full and complete area of redemptive work for the glory of God 
And so I trust today that God will let you see this. Now, I realize that um, when we talk about maturity, that we're talking about something that it takes a lifetime to get people into. And it's so difficult to uh, uh, put down precepts that will adequately uh, relate man to a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Uh, But, you know, you can have instant cleansing, but it takes a lifetime to get you to maturity. And yet, just a little babe in Christ can see the eternalness of God and the eternalness of God's plan for man and be willing to yield to that eternal plan of God from the very outset. So when we talk about maturity, we sometimes get a little confused. We confuse maturity with cleansiness and rightness with God. And, uh, and then again, we, we think that a man will have to live for 15 or 20 years before he would ever get willing to just uh, become a father. And so, um, and that's not the case. In his heart, in his attitude, he can, he can be uh, entering in on the eternal call of God from the very outset. So I trust that some way, somehow, God will speak to you. That if we are on the level of the little children, we'll not stay there that we will learn how to be overcomers in Christ Jesus. And uh, if we are just overcomers, then that's all. That we'll find the eternal plan of God and just literally lay our lives down to see the will of God done in that eternal purpose of His. And may the Lord really direct you as you hear this message. Now, I want to talk to you about some words that relate to spiritual growth. Now, these are just words that I think would be good for you to uh, think on. Now, please do not think that I'm giving you a definition uh, of these words in their completeness. I am only making a statement or two that relate to these words in the matter of spiritual growth. And I want you to relate to these uh, Words, for instance, uh, one very important word in uh, spiritual growth would be life. Now, what do you feel uh, would define the word life? Now, this word life is so significant in spiritual growth or in any kind of growth as far as that goes, but spiritual growth. So here's what I say. In relationship to spiritual growth, life, God, God in you, uh, he's life, yes, in the form of Jesus Christ. That's right. And then I think about the Holy Spirit in relationship to spiritual growth. And here I, uh, I think about the... Uh, resident person in the heart to express the the living Lord. That's right. And then after the Holy Spirit, I, uh, I think about desires. And I have put down the fire of the soul expressed. Now that certainly is not altogether complete. But men do not go beyond their desires. And then I think about um, revelation. And when I think about revelation, I think about the Word of God. But I am dividing up the Word of God in revelation. And... um, When I think about Revelation, I think about getting God's viewpoint. And then when I think about the Word of God, I think about uh, God's message to man. And when I think about the Word of God, I think about God's message in general to man, 
giving him the whole scope of God's intention for man, God's provision for man. And then the word of God specifically written to man, which is for the purpose of bringing man into the reality of life. And then I think about uh, faith. And when I think about faith, I think about that God-given ability and responsibility whereby man can obey, receive from, and believe God by choice according to the revelation of God by the word of God to the heart of a man. And then I think about understanding. And I think that is uh, man coming to understand what he knows. Then I think about the word knowing. I think uh, the word knowing can be well defined as the wisdom of God. And then out of that, I think about habits. And I think that habit is a pattern that is spontaneously expressed, consistently expressed in the life of the believer, having its full source in the Lord. Well, I wanted to give those words to you in relationship to spiritual growth. I just want you to think on them. And really what I'd like for you to do is come up with your own definition in relationship to these different words because I think you will find that they definitely relate to spiritual growth. I would like to enlarge on these words, or not only on the definition of these words, but enlarge the list. Uh, so I could take in the whole scope of uh, spiritual growth. I'd like to have every element that really relates to spiritual growth down on a sheet of paper so I could do some meditating on those words. So it may be that you could help and return uh, by mail, you know, something of your findings. Well, it has really been a joy to get this tape. We've had a great deal of uh, conflict in it and you will find that there are some noises such as the uh, grandfather clock uh, bonging out its uh, time uh, to other noises, but I believe that they will not be so distracting that it will uh, take away from the message. I believe this, that uh, you will have to say that certainly everything's down to earth and very non-professional. But very, by the very next time we make one of these tapes, it may be that we can be a little more professional about the making of the tape. I trust so. May the Lord bless you, and this is the end of the tape. And I thank you for your prayerful support, and uh, I thank you for your understanding about uh, the making of the tapes and so on from month to month. Your friend in Christ, Manly Beasley.